This is uh, Randall Moreland. He's going to give us his thesis defense. Um, the title of his thesis is Effects of Agricultural Activities on the Migration of the Hinkley, we should put in hexavalent, chromium plume, San Bernardino County, California. So with that, go ahead, Randall, it's all yours. Thank you, Rich. Well, I won't repeat the title since uh, Rich already stated it. Um, kind of give you a brief outline of what I'll be talking about here. I'll give you some background information because I'm sure not a lot of people are familiar with Hinkley. Um, then I'll give you my hypothesis and then we'll go into the methods I took to, uh, to look into my hypothesis. Um, then I'll give you my results and then we'll discuss those results. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with uh, Hinkley, California, it was made famous uh, by the movie Aaron Brockovich starring Julia Roberts. Um, and the location, the Hinkley Valley is, is located in the Mojave Desert. Um, it's about 15 kilometers uh, directly west of Barstow, California on Highway 58. Um, it's a closed basin. Um, it's bounded to the north by Harper Lake. Uh, bound to the south by the Mojave River, and then on the east and west by the local mountains. Uh, this is just a location map so you can get familiar with where we're at. We're over here in the Mojave Desert uh, region. Um, like I said, just directly west of the city of Barstow. So if you're ever heading up to Vegas, stop by Hinkley. Although you might miss it, so. Um, so this is a uh, aerial photograph of, uh, of Hinkley, California. And as you can see, it's a very rural environment. The, predominantly, it's residential as well as agricultural activities out there. Um, and the main source of water is the groundwater. Uh, there aren't any pipelines uh, that are hooked up to Hinkley. So everybody relies solely on the groundwater, although now, uh, due to uh, regulatory activities now actually bottled water is being supplied and we'll talk about that later on in the presentation uh, but as you can see here down here by the this is Mojave River uh, right here as you see it's not flowing at the time so uh, but along the Mojave River you have all this agricultural activity going on here and uh, up here as well and these are actually dairy farms and the uh, the green is uh, alfalfa fields so that's predominantly the agricultural uh, activity that's going on in the area. Uh, this is a uh, satellite image from uh, March of 1989. So as you can see, even back then, there was even more agricultural activity going on. So um, just for reference, this is uh, uh, Highway 58 here. Um, and the Mojave River actually is out of this picture. It's down here. And then uh, Harper Lake is up out of the picture, up to the north here. And then uh, this is a uh, satellite image from 2011. As you can see from the previous photo, a lot of this area right here was was all alfalfa fields. And as you see, the the drop in agricultural activities, as well as there's not as many people living out there now due to the limited groundwater resources. Um, but the dairy farms are still active out there, as well as this one here. Um, so there still is agriculture activities happening today. Now, as I just mentioned, uh, groundwater is a limited resource, obviously. It is the desert, so there's not a lot of rainfall. Um, and so the, mo the majority of the water that, that's supplied to this area comes from the Mojave River. Now, uh, the Mojave River flows from the San Bernardino Mountains and basically ends up kind of over by Zizix is where it, it ends there. Um, but so as you can see, based off this map, you can see that there's actually a lot of communities along this river. Now, if you're down here by Barstow, you're hoping that some of the water actually makes it to you. Well, back in 1990, uh, or Prior to 1990, Barso was, you know, struggling getting any kind of groundwater resources. Considering they're right on the Mojave River, they thought, you know, it wouldn't be an issue. But they, in fact, were having a lot of wells dry up. 
So in 1990, they filed a lawsuit against the city of Ant Atalanta. I don't know why they went straight for the city of Atalanta, but the case was actually against all of the communities upstream of Barstow, stating that they were uh, stealing their water. So the court ruled, uh, they finally made a ruling in 1996 on this case that basically said the, uh, the whole Mojave River Basin is in overdraft right now and they tasked the Mojave Water Agency with, uh, with they're gonna be in charge of the adjudication of the basin. So essentially what that is is a groundwater management system. So uh, they, were, they were tasked to kind of come up with ways of getting water, more water into the basin as well as managing their, the resources that they do have in the basin. So on top of the limited resource, then another way to limit the, re the groundwater resource is uh, pollution. Uh, also located in the Hinkley Valley is one of uh, Pacific Gas and Electric's uh, gas compressor stations that basically the line goes from Topak all the way up to uh, the Oregon border and they have these compressor stations all along the way. Well this one in Hinkley uh, started operating in about nine, early 1950s, about 1950, 1951, um, and a lot, and they were having problems initially with their uh, their lines. They were they were leaking, so they they decided to that uh, to prevent the corrosion. They they got a, a corrosion inhibitor, which contained chromium six. They were using that to protect their cooling lines, and then after they they uh, finish using this uh, corrosion inhibitor, they would just discharge it to basically the ground. Eventually they dug some holes, but they're still on line ponds. Up until 1965, uh, they kind of realized that they had an issue here that uh, they might need to address in the future. So they switched over to a molybdenum-based corrosion inhibitor. So they got rid of the chromium-6, um, and then they also uh, put in line ponds but then again, these were kind of very limited line. There wasn't a lot of engineering. It was just basically they had tarp down. Uh, so, and then basically this continued until 1987, uh, PG&E, uh, they took some water samples of the, uh, from the uh, residential wells. Uh, one of the downgradient wells uh, had a maximum of 580 micrograms per liter of total chromium. They weren't actually sampling for hexavalent chromium at the time, but for total chromium, that was high. All right, and uh, so let's go over to kind of the previous studies that have been done in the area. Um, in 2007, uh, Dr. Richard Layton and his group uh, did some, did a hydrogeologic report on the Harper Lake Basin, which includes the Hinkley Valley. And basically they took, uh, the, uh, there was 377 wells uh, sampled, and basically they did uh, kind of uh, groundwater elevation, historical groundwater elevations, as well as uh, chemical analysis of the water for all of Harper Lake. Um, also in 2007, uh, PG&E hired uh, CH2M Hill Consulting to do a groundwater background study uh, to for the uh, the chromium six. Now, this was I don't know who approved of this report, but uh, to go about with it. But the re essentially the report was uh, they took 48 wells which they thought were outside of the plume boundary, and they took a one year sample. So they took four four samples. So each one each for a quarter. Uh, during the 2006 sampling, and they measured uh, chromium-6 and total chromium. And, and also another thing with the wells that they sampled, they sampled the domestic wells, because a lot of their monitoring wells were within the, the chromium plume, so they figured if we want to get a background level, let's stay away from the chromium plume. Well, they, based off that, they, and this is also on an initial uh, plume boundaries that they kind of 
drew up without actually knowing where the plume boundary was, which we'll get into a little later. Uh, that so they went a little up gradient, a little outside the plume boundary, and they found that the background levels that they found were 3.1 uh, micrograms per liter for chromium six, and then 3.2 microgram liters for uh, total chromium. And the way they did that was they just took all the samples that they did and then just took a statistical mean of the values and came up with those. Um, now in 2012, uh, Izbiki from the USGS went out there and because basically the water board did not approve of their background study, so they asked for more research. So Izbiki started doing some research on how to delineate the boundary between native uh, native chromium-6 and contaminated or anthropogenic chromium-6. So the way he did it was he looked at the uh, chromium isotopes uh, 52 and 53 and tried to decipher it, was there a difference between the natural uh, chrome-6 in the groundwater and the anthropogenic. Well his research uh, he did it in Hinkley El Mirage and Topak, all three of these uh, sites uh, have chromium-6 and total chromium uh, contamination going on. Uh, his, the research actually was, they, they didn't figure anything out basically. They said they could not figure out what the boundary, or they could not delineate the boundary of the plume based off of their isotopic composition uh, analysis. So let me give you a little background on the geology of the Hinkley Valley. The, the Hinkley Valley was actually formed from the uh, uh, Mojave River at one point was flowing into the Harper Lake. So this was uh, the sediments are, the, the floodplain sediments right now are the uh, sediments from the Mojave River. Uh, one thing to note is the Mojave River headwaters are in the San Bernardino Mountains which does contain uh, metamorphic rocks which uh, chromite is, is found in the metamorphic rocks, not only in the San Rio Mountains, but also in the San Gabriel Mountains. Uh, so you kind of expect natural, naturally occurring chromium-6 in the Mojave Desert, as well as in the, uh, the El Mirage Basin, which is from the San Gabriel Mountains. Uh, this is just a uh, generalized cross-section of the Hinkley Valley. Um, the, the top layer, uh, which is known as floodplain aquifer, is the uh, Mojave River sediments. And below that is a, what they call a blue clay unit, although different parts, it's different colors. So there's a gray part of it, there's a green, and then the, predominantly it's a blue clay. Um, this actually represents the, uh, the ancient Harper Lake. Uh, which extended much farther south than where it is now. So part of Hinkley Valley at one time was, was under uh, Harper Lake. Um, and then the bedrock uh, in the area is mostly uh, high-grade metamorphic rocks, gneisses, and marbles. Uh, this is based off the uh, local mountains which bound it to the east and west. Uh, those are both high-grade metamorphic rocks. So the uh, Mojave River sediments, uh, they, they show basic, what you typically see with river sediments, arcosic, uh, they're light gray, uh, some brown in color, they're coarse to fine grain. Uh, the blue clay unit, as I said, was a lacustrine deposit. Um, they believe it to be Pleistocene in age based off the, uh, the uh, when Harper Lake was, was full. Uh, and as I said before, it's blue, gray, and green, and then it ranges in size from clay to silt. Um, and then below that, actually, uh, I didn't mention down here was the uh, where the regional aquifer is is uh, the um, the local mountain sediments. Uh, so this is this ranges from uh, size from clay to gravel, depending on where you are in the valley, um, and it's basically the weather. Bedrock. So, and also, as as I said before, this is the local mountains are metamorphic rocks. So, there's a high chance that even in the regional aquifer, you'll see higher elevations of chromium six. Uh, this is a geologic map of the area. Um, 
as you see, this is the, uh, the site where the discharge occurred. Um, the majority of the Hinkley Valley is this, uh, at least on the surface, is this uh, Mojave River alluvium deposit. Um, out here in the eastern section, you see uh, remnants of the old uh, Harper Lake, where the uh, clay actually surfaces. Um, and then down here is uh, this, uh, the, uh, the uh, local mountain sediments, which actually surfaces here, but in the Hinkley Valley, most of it's underneath the uh, blue clay unit. Um, but as you see, it's bounded up here uh, by, by the local mountains here, local mountains here. And another issue with this was, is, is this fault bounding right here, which we won't discuss in this uh, presentation, but that requires future, future research on that. All right, now we'll discuss the uh, hydrology of the Hinkley Valley. Uh, as I said before, the main source of groundwater recharge is the Mojave River. There is a little bit of runoff from the local mountains, uh, but the main driving force for the groundwater recharge is the Mojave River. Um, and the, so the floodplain aquifer uh, is, as I said before, made up of the Mojave River sediments. Uh, depth of groundwater is approximately 100 feet, so about 30 meters. Um, and then below the blue clay unit, you have your regional aquifer, which, uh, as I said before, is sourced from the uh, local mountains. And essentially, this is a confined aquifer. Uh, now, the reason why I put it in quotes, we'll get into a little later, as we'll discuss the uh, activities out there in the Hinkley Valley. So, this right here, this map, is a uh, plume map that was uh, drawn up by the consultant CH2M Hill. Uh, this was the third quarter sampling in 2011. Um, now the, uh, the red line uh, is the uh, 50 parts per billion. The orange line, and up here too, is 10 parts per billion. And this green line is what they called their background levels of 3.1 parts per billion uh, chrome 6. Now, what stood out uh, right away was, what is this doing out here? So, is there something that could be pulling the plume this way? Or is this natural background levels that they're actually detecting that are above the 3.1? Uh, so that's the point of this, this research is, why is this being drawn out here? Now, is it possible that that's just natural or it actually is the plume? So when you look at uh, the, uh, the area that it is, as we, we uh, point out over here was where all the agricultural activity. So we wanted to see, did the agricultural activity that was happening out there, is it somehow affecting the migration of the plume by because there's, there's large uh, wells out there, so are they pulling on the plume? Um, or like I said, is this just naturally occurring uh, background levels? Now in order to answer this question, um, we had to do certain steps. One of the steps, the first steps was data collection. Um, we did not actually go out there and sample these wells uh, because luckily the water board at PG&E have been sampling this, uh, the area since 1988. So uh, we were able to get all the, uh, water, uh, the water elevation data from the uh, water board as well as from uh, Pacific Gas and Electric. Uh, then we'll move on to our, once we collected the data, we had to, a lot of it was in PDF form or just given to us as a paper copy. So we had to somehow create a database to manage and analyze all this data. So uh, we were uh, introduced to uh, the software called uh, HydroDave from uh, one of the uh, local consultants, Wildermuth, who uh, one of the, the uh, people that works there, she, she was a graduate of Cal State Fullerton. So she, uh, uh, kind of showed me HydroDave and the capabilities and we thought this would be a really good way to build our database so that way we can eventually analyze it to figure out you know the, the things we're looking for in the groundwater. Uh, 
Now, the Hydro Dave is, is split into two, two, so, two different uh, uh, programs in the software. Uh, one is the Hydro Dave Explorer, which is kind of like Google Earth, but it has tools where you can uh, use groundwater data to kind of visualize groundwater elevations, uh, you know, any kind of chemical analysis on the groundwater. Um, and then there's Hydro Dave Manager, which is kind of the, like the background of Hydro Dave Explorer. It's a lot of the uh, creating the database. So this is uh, what you start out with in Hydro Dave Manager. You get a, uh, an Excel template. And basically the way it is is you have these fields that you have to fill out and a lot of it is drop down menus so that way you know your data looks similar to your other well so you're not having you know one well look completely different to the other one. Uh, basically you enter in all this information here and there's multiple tabs uh, down here that you have to fill out for each well. So once you get all that, uh, you upload it to Hydro Dave Manager, uh, which is a screen just like this, um, where you upload it, and what it does is it checks your data entry to make sure you're not creating any duplicates or there's not any errors to where, uh, say if you put a screen interval deeper than your total depth of your well. So it'll tell you, say, hey, this won't work. So once you get it in there, um, It'll, it'll, it'll be approved, and then once it's approved, you'll be able to open up HydroDave Explorer, add, and then you can uh, basically see the wells which are geo-referenced based off the Hydro Manager. So once you get your wells added into HydroDave Explorer, there's multiple tools you can run. Uh, this one right here uh, is a chemical analysis. Uh, you can do it for multiple. They have a, a long list of uh, chemicals that you could, uh, that you could uh, run the query for. And basically this is just a concentra uh, concentration versus date uh, plot. Um, same thing goes for groundwater level elevations. Um, and one thing to know is you can do it with multiple wells uh, at the same time. And also it has the capability of creating uh, cross sections. So you can enter in your log data um, I will say though, this is very time consuming. So <laughs> if you can get somebody to enter that data in for you, it's so much better. So <laughs> to, we have all the data in our database, so we need to figure out how are we going to analyze it uh, to kind of to understand the uh, groundwater elevations and what they're trying to tell us. So uh, we ended up go using ArcMap 10.2 uh, to, to uh, create uh, groundwater elevation maps. Now to do that we used uh, the Kriging method, uh, specifically the empirical Bayesian Kriging. Uh, what it does is it averages the uh, distance between the measured values and then basically spits out a, a predicted value in between those two. Um, and yeah, this is not Hinkley, so that's not what my model looks like. But that's kind of the basic idea of what it does is it draws a line between these two. It draws a basically a straight line. Uh, so what we did was we entered our geo-referenced uh, wells into, our, into ArcGIS and we used the groundwater elevations as a z-value. Um, so that way the, the way the Kriging tool works is it has to have a three-dimensional uh, look to it. So that way you can draw your, your groundwater elevation maps. So the uh, first thing we wanted to do was look at what is the uh, groundwater doing in regards to its elevation. Um, now we did this using 11 of the wells which were sampled from 1988 to 2012. Um, the uh, closest one to the facility and it's also the closest one to Mojave River so you expect it to be the higher uh, groundwater elevations was M MW1. And then the farthest down gradient during the sampling was MW10. Um, and then we also took a, a look at the uh, rainfall totals for the months from 1988 to 2012, uh, just to see if maybe, if we'll, we'll add that into the equation of if that has an effect on the groundwater elevations. So this is our uh, plot of the groundwater elevations for each well. 
Uh, like I said, MW1 was showing the highest elevations. Uh, but it's what, one thing that's really critical to see here was pretty much all the wells are showing a steady decline from 88 to about uh, probably about 94. Well, at this time is when uh, the adjudication lawsuit is going on, and uh, the, w the way the adjudication works in regards to uh, limiting the amount of water usage was it said for the, uh, the, the people that are using more than 10 acre feet per year, it said we're going to take your, your highest uh, production that you did from 1986 to 1990 and that's going to be your limit. You can't produce more than that. So, as you can see here, uh, you know, once the, they kind of set that into motion, groundwater elevation started to rise. Um, and then also, you know, at that same time, which I don't understand how this worked out, there's a heavy rainfall occurred for a good amount of time. And so that also aided in the uh, recharge of the basin. But as you can see, the adjudication has had a, a tremendous effect on the groundwater elevations. As you can see, uh, for the most part, a lot of the, the, the groundwater is much higher than when it was in the uh, 80s and early 90s. Um, so after doing our, uh, using ArcGIS, we were able to create these uh, uh, groundwater elevation maps. Um, so what we did was, uh, Basically, we took our first uh, sampling period, which was the first quarter of uh, 1989, uh, and we, we plotted the, we used the, the tool to run, and what it does is it creates this, uh, this colorful tool here, and then we're able to do contour lines on top of that. And from that, we were able to, uh, to get a gradient as well, so we can get a flow direction and a gradient to see if any, if the gradient or if the flow direction or gradient have changed over time. So this was the uh, first one run in 1989. Second one was run in 1994 because that seemed like a pivotal time to when the adjudication kind of started taking place. Um, as you see, the groundwater flow is roughly still to the northwest. Um, and the, uh, the gradient has dropped to 0.04 now. Um, and then the next sample that we took was in 2000. And uh, one thing to note actually is the groundwater flow actually changes uh, slightly and starts going a little to, more to the west. Um, and the gradient went back up to 0.05. And then the next sample period, the groundwater is back to its normal flow to the northwest. Um, and now it's, the gradient has dropped off significantly during this time. Um, and then the last result was in 2012, and as you see, we have a lot more wells, which we'll get into uh, uh, in the discussion of, uh, of all these wells that are popping up out here now. So this actually gives you a better picture to where we're not actually interpolating uh, past, we're actually getting real data outside of these first initial wells. So as you see, the uh, groundwater flow is still to the northwest. Uh, so just kind of a, a, a recap of all the sampling. Um, the only change in groundwater flow direction was in 2000 where it was a little bit more of a west, it had a little bit more of a western shift. But for the, for the general consensus, it's basically a northwest flow. The gradient kind of goes all over the place, but it's not a significant change, really. All right, so we'll, we'll discuss the data that we just went o over with and how it relates to the chromium plume as well as the background levels in the Hinkley Valley. Um, as, we, as we stated before, the, the, uh, there was a significant drop in groundwater elevations from 88 to 94, which was due to the, uh, the, due to prior the, to the adjudication of the basin which after the adjudication, you start seeing a rise from 94 to the present. Um, and we showed that there, there was no evidence to show that the groundwater was flowing to the east. So based off that plume map, uh, if you just look at the groundwater flow direction, 
there's no possible way for the plume to be migrating that way, to be migrating to the east, to where we saw all that branch of the plume. Um, and then we see some changes in the gradient. Um, it could be due to uh, the change in the water usage, obviously. Uh, you know, more people have moved out of the Hinkley Valley, so there's not a lot of, there's not as much demand on the groundwater resources as there was. Um, like I said, the uh, study area was to the east, which was cross gradient to our, to the uh, groundwater uh, flow direction, or it's, uh, sorry, cross gradient to the, from the compressor station. Um, we, the, the results show that the, there was no cross gradient flow, which means that the agricultural activities were not having an adverse effect on the groundwater flow direction. Uh, the driving force for the groundwater flow is the uh, regional groundwater, um, as done in, in previous uh, research has shown that it's generally to the northwest towards Harper Lake. Um, so based off that, the agricultural activities on the eastern side of the valley had no effect on the uh, migration of the plume. Um, so as I said, our results disagree with this right here. For, if we were looking at just the groundwater flow, everything should be flowing this way. And actually, there's a little bit of a, a bedrock right here, so it kind of uh, goes around that. But there's no evidence that supports this, the drawing of the plume out here. Um, what's interesting about that was uh, the USGS was just awarded a $5 million grant to do the research on this on being able to uh, delineate the boundary of this plume. And so essentially, I just helped them out a little bit by looking at the groundwater itself. Now they'll add chemistry on top of it. So I'm hoping to see the check uh, waiting at my house when I get there, so. <laughs> so my conclusions uh, were based off the, the uh, the analysis of the groundwater elevations that the plume could not migrate cross gradient to the east. The, uh, so the agricultural activities did not have an effect on the, uh, on, the, the, on the groundwater flow direction. But there is possibility that they do have an effect on the groundwater gradient because that is uh, essentially based off the water usage depending on where is, who is pumping where. Uh, because one of the things of the Hinkley Valley, actually I forgot to mention this, was when I had the confined aquifer in quotes, was yeah, there is this blue clay unit, but a lot of these agriculture ag wells that are, that are doing more than 10 acre uh, feet per year, they're actually screened in both the floodplain and the regional uh, aquifer. So there, there is some, inter I believe there's some intermingling going on between the, uh, the lower uh, aquifer and the upper aquifer. Uh, PG&E just started looking into the uh, regional aquifer, so they just, in 2011, they started drilling the deep wells uh, to monitor the, uh, the uh, chrome six levels in the uh, regional aquifer. So um, they're still, still, use, still trying to figure out if the regional aquifer is being affected by the plume or if that's just naturally occurring. So hopefully this is Bicky and USGS research will kind of help out with the regional aquifer as well as the floodplain. Um, so, and then just my last statement, more research is needed on figuring out the boundary between the naturally occurring chrome six in the groundwater and the anthropogenic uh, chrome six. I would like to thank, uh, first off, all you guys for showing up uh, during the summer. That's great. Um, and I would like to thank the Lawton Water Board as well as PG&E for supplying me with all the reports and the data, um, as well as uh, Wildermuth, uh, especially Viva, who uh, was the one kind of walked me through the Hydro Dave and any kind of technical support I needed, she was there for that.